Do you think Senator Paul can run on an isolationist platform with all the troubles in the world? Rand Paul, with all due respect, is basically an isolationist. He doesn't believe we ought to be involved in that part of the world. You keep using the word. I don't think it means what you think it means. Uh, look, I, I think we throw this term around isolationist, and that has a very specific meaning. In the Republican Party, the last time we had a big debate on this between the internationalist wing and the isolationist wing of the party, it was in 1952 between Eisenhower and Taft. So what is it that we are defining as isolationism? Is it the unwillingness to send in a large American land army to Baghdad, to Iraq for the third time in 20 years? And I don't think that labeling someone an isolationist because of their opposition to that is going to hold water necessarily in a Republican primary because I think Rand Paul is where the country is and I think where he is where an overwhelming majority of Republicans are on this issue. I don't think there's any constituency that wants to see American ground forces engaged in, in, a, in a huge way fighting ISIS in Iraq right now and the, and the reality on the ground is we have two sets of American enemies. We have Shia extremists and Sunni extremists who are now in a, uh, in a death match, a death struggle with each other. There's no amount of American action that can recork the sectarian hatreds that have been unleashed here. Shia and Sunni have been fighting an intractable war against each other for the better part of 700 years. Uh, there's no amount of American manpower that's going to be able to stop that. So we have a very difficult situation on the ground. And we have a prejudice of news coverage in the country, Lawrence, where uh, you know, we think that everything that happens in the world is, is derivative of something the United States does or does not do. And in fact, culture and religion are powerful forces, and we see it all playing out as these lines drawn after World War I now are beginning to unravel. You don't like being called an isolationist, do you? Yeah, and you think people would kind of get it. I've been trying to say that for the last four years in public life, that I'm neither an isolationist nor an interventionist. I'm someone who believes in the Constitution and believes that America should have a strong national defense and believes that we should defend ourselves. But when we do it, we should do it the way the Constitution intended, and that's that the president should come before Congress and make the case for war. When you are president, what do you do about ISIS, especially in Iraq? Well, you know, I think you have to do a lot of things. First, you have to understand the mistakes of the past in order to not make them again. One of the mistakes of the past is for 10 years we've been supplying arms and training to a sectarian government in Baghdad. This is almost entirely Shiite. They've booted out and kicked out most of the Sunnis. They've angered most of the Sunnis in the country. And so really you have a Shiite garrison in Mosul unable to keep that city because the city's almost entirely Sunni. So you have to get rid of having one government in Baghdad that's entirely sectarian. But that's a 10-year long problem. We haven't made it any better because we kept supporting Maliki all these years when he really wasn't uh, able to develop a real national government or a national army. Second, I think if you're going to arm people over there, you shouldn't arm those who are feckless and don't fight well and who let their arms basically be directly captured by ISIS. Well, I agree with the you. I mean, I think the president should cut out the middleman, and instead of sending uh, weapons to Iraqi fighters right now that, that we're training uh, with no clear good result in sight, he should just be sending them to ISIS because that's essentially <laughs> where they are going, unfortunately. Uh, so well, the, the only other, the other thing I would say, though, is I, I would probably go ahead and arm the Kurds directly. The Kurds will fight. And I would also promise the Kurds a homeland. If they're willing to fight, I'd say this is your land. It's yours when the war is done. This is your homeland and your nation. All right. I mean, you, the, you, you have some lofty goals for Iraq and what it's going to take to stabilize, uh, you know, a very tribalistic part of the world. Can you do that? Can you accomplish that without boots on the ground? Well, I think there has to be boots on the ground, but they need to be Arab boots on the ground. You'll find no lasting peace or no long-lived peace that doesn't include that the people who live there want to win as much or more than anyone else. If there's not the will to win by the people who actually live there, there is no possible victory and there is no possible peace that will come out of this. So you need to engage the people who live there. The Turks need to be involved. The Kurds need to be involved. The Iraqis need to have a more national government, national movement. The Sunni chieftains need to be involved. And ultimately, a government in Syria could be involved.
but I think it would have to ultimately be a government minus Assad. So there are a lot of things that have to happen, and it's not simple or somebody would have fixed it already, but I think ultimately it requires a coalition of civilized Islamic countries that will stamp out this barbaric form of Islam, but it can't be done just by American troops, and I think even more and more uh, Republican leaders are admitting that uh, putting 100,000 troops back in there isn't the answer. No American boots back over there. Uh, maybe a small amount that have to be there to protect the embassies and our consulate and to make sure that, we're, uh, that we are adequately defending American interests. But as far as the act of fighting and overturning, it really needs to be the boots on the air. It needs to be Arab boots on the ground. I differ from most of the other Republican candidates. Most of them would uh, put significant numbers of troops back in there. The biggest mistake in the Middle East, if you want to look at one consistent mistake, has been toppling secular dictators, yeah. leads to chaos and to the rise of radical Islam. So we need to look before we leap, and we need to first do no harm, because a lot of what's happened in the Middle East has actually made us less safe. Facts are meaningless. You can use facts to prove anything that's even remotely true. Facts, Max. Hey.